get started. Um, Feliciano, this opportunity, how did it come about? Uh, we just got a call from 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 our promoter, Lou Tabella. Um, that's really it, man. We just, you know, we stay in the gym, waiting on opportunities like this. is a great opportunity. Uh, Pro Box TV has been doing wonderful. Um, like I said about my opponent, that he's a solid fighter, and I think that um, two young guys like ourselves going at it is gonna be a wonderful fight. And um, yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Good to know. Um, what does this fight do for your career? It's basically like a week or two into January, 2024. Does this propel you into a breakout year? I believe so. I think a victory, um, over Lewis would definitely do that. Um, that's what we're obviously looking, you know, to happen to elevate and, um, keep going up in the ranks and, and get those bigger fights. Okay, good to know, good to know. Um, one thing I was scrolling through, I was doing my stalker stuff. Um, you had an accident, I believe, after a showbox fight. What happened? Or am I just misreading that? Because it led to some inactivity in your career. What nah, was yeah. I had a I had a um I had a car accident. Um it was probably like two to three weeks after the showbox fight. And um, I wasn't at fault, though. It was the, the other party's fault. And um, I injured my, my wrist. So that kept me out of the ring for a little bit. But everything's good now. I've obviously been fighting since. I've had four or five fights since. So, you know, everything's that's, cool. That's a theme of your career. I was looking. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, you had seven pro fights before you graduated high school? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think <laughs> I turned pro when I was a junior. Well, talk about that because I mean, like, your your boxing is one of the hardest professions to deal with, and you're basically like Peter Parker, Spider Man. You're like balancing <laughs> this like really difficult career with like going to geometry and stuff. Yeah, um, I don't know it. I don't feel like it was um, anything too difficult. It's obviously a little different than the norm. Um, I don't think it was anything too too difficult. I've been boxing for forever, so it's like, you know, well, obviously, you know, being a professional is much different than an amateur fighter. But as far as being into the sport or in the sport, um, it wasn't nothing different. It's just, you know, I go to school, get out, go train, and just repeat the process. What was that decision like? Because most kids in high school, it's kind of like waiting for national tournaments, etc. How did your team make that decision? Was there like a big opportunity on the table for you to go pro at that point? Not necessarily the big opportunity. Um, I think just my team and I just felt like it was time to make that transition. And um, a lot of BS within the amateurs on my end, not as a whole, but on my end. So it's like, you know, we sat down and we talked about it and we, we made a decision. So I take it you felt you had a pro style that wasn't getting rewarded in the amateurs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I felt We felt like that for a while, though even before making a decision like years before. So you were, you felt like you were on the end where you were landing more consequential punches, but the volume of the opponent was being rewarded more than the consequences. Exactly. Out. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, I just always like to make sure that I'm understanding the words I'm hearing. So I always like to yeah, go yeah. Back over that. Um, uh, let's go over a couple more things. You've headlined a few show box cards. Um, it felt like that, like that, platform was building you up to be a fighter like a boots or one of these guys that was going to Regis pro Gray comes to mind where you were going to get a major opportunity and then kind of show box show times out of boxing is this like i guess what i'm trying to say is like you were on the path of being a headliner you're a headliner for this card do you feel like this is where you're like you're about to i guess i've said it before but like it feel it's not very often you find a guy who headlined a card in 2021 and they're relatively in the same spot in 2024, kind of. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, like I said earlier, I think that's that's the goal to continue to um, fight these young guys, undefeated solid fighters, and, 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 and um, elevate as far as the rankings and work my way up to the bigger fights. But, um, yeah, I mean, headlining is awesome. Headlining is definitely awesome. It's definitely um, something that, 
I think that uh a lot of fighters um like they they they're fueled to 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 do that, you know what I'm saying? And um it's a great thing. And when opportunities like this pop up, it's just like, you know what I mean? You gotta take full advantage of it. Okay. Um you once told me the story of your your nickname and I found it very compelling. I if I remember you went from mad to marvelous and it was from a newspaper story. Can you can you refresh my memory on your best memory of that? Because I found that as a very endearing moment in your story arc of your career. Yeah, so I so to start, I got the nickname um when I was much, much younger and I first started uh boxing. Um, my trainer. I always he, you know, he said I used he always said I used to come into the gym like looking angry and like, you know, not speak too much and like he just called me Mad Mike, like you know, Mike, Mike or Mikey is my nickname, what I go by. But he put the Mad in front of it, and then um, over time, as I started fighting more, da, 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 I believe I believe I was already professional when I got the the marvelous name. Um, a writer, he um, he put it out. He he did a story on me, and he put he put that out there, and we kind of just ran with it. It kind of fit, so we ran with it. So it was a it was a headline that said from yeah Matt yeah Marvelous, it was like right? a story on a newspaper yeah yeah that's because like I always when I saw you the first time I'm like okay northeast guy marvelous you're probably a huge Marvin Hagler fan but I think it's yeah. kind of interesting that maybe the writer was a Marvin Hagler fan so, and you just got adopted the nickname yeah I think I think yeah I think you're pretty dead on with that for sure I would agree okay I'm I'm hitting it out the park um. Boxing coach, tell us a little bit about your coach and um, kind of your relationship dating back and kind of like the bond that you two have built. So I first got introduced to Paul, which is my head trainer, Paul Cishan, by um, an aunt of mine back when she was fighting years ago. Obviously, I was um, seven going on eight. I'm 25 now, so some time ago. Um, she brought me to the gym and... Um, you know, over time, you know, it's, I don't know, I feel like a, 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 a coach's and a fighter's bond is like father-son or father-daughter or, you know, however the case may be. But, you know, over time, obviously spending, you know, every day um, in a gym, um, eventually traveling together state to state and um, just having it, building that chemistry and that bond. It's like a father figure, another father figure. And um, it's been like that since I can remember. And um, it's still uh, to like that, excuse me, it's still like that to this day. And um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it, man. He's just a great guy. He's been around, like I said, since seven or eight years old, since I was seven or eight. And um, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna um, ride this out until the wheels go fall off. Well, I think, Part of that father-son relationship, in my mind, is just, like, being there, like a good version. Like, a good boxing coach, maybe they know something, maybe they don't. But as long as you're there for 20 years, that speaks more than, like, how good of a coach you are. It's like the the investment in time, to me, builds that bond. Right. Yeah, definitely. I think that, um, I think that, um, Coaches are important in any sport, though, not just boxing. But I think that that they're very important. Um, you know, some kids might not get that type of love at home or that type of attention, or they might be, you know, um, without a dad or, or, or a mother or whatever. So I think those relationships are very important and does something to the kid. And um, like I said, he's been with me for forever, and that's the way he's going to stay. Is that is that something that you felt that like your coach your coach kind of became a figure in your life um, to help in maybe difficult times? Um, I don't know. I just I don't know. I mean, it's been like that for sure. I don't know. I I guess you know from the man upstairs, he's probably he was put into my life for that purpose. But um, that's that's how it's always been. He's always helped me. Um, you know, with anything across the board, um, advice and just anything, life, just life stuff outside of the boxing world. He's he's always there and helped me. So, 
like I said, it's a great thing. Second very, generation very boxer? Much. Are you a second generation boxer, third generation? You said your aunt boxed. Um, how many? Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm really, yeah, I mean, I would say, when I say my aunt too, let me clear it up. My aunt is like my mom's best friend. Like, it's not like blood, but like she's been around since before I was even thought of. So we've, we've had, we've gained that, uh, that relationship and that bond of like a nephew over the years and stuff like that. But since I was even thought of, she's been around, but, um, I'm really the only one, like I've had, I've had like relatives from like, you know, different sides of families, like box and try to box and this and that. But I think I'm, I'm like the one that's, you know, doing it to this extent, to this level. You're that dude. Um, let's see. What's the Jackie Callen. How is she your manager? You said, how is she my manager? Yeah. What's the story? So, um, <clears throat> I was actually an amateur, but well, my trainer pauses. She, he's known her since for, for a while. So, um, he had another fighter that was signed to her way before. So he's known her for forever, but, um, as an amateur, I was probably like 13, 14. And my trainer was like trying to set things up for the next few years because I could go, you know, we could go pro at 18. So he's trying to set things up, set a team up, and this and this and that. So he um he flew her out to Connecticut. You know, she's from Detroit area. He flew her out to um Connecticut to see me compete in a show that he put on. And um I think I was about 14. And um I was like, you know, the main event and all this stuff. And um Ever since then, me and her kept in contact, like, just, you know, hey, how you doing? Hope all is well over the years and stuff like that. So when it was time to to um, sign and, you know, get a manager, like, it was ideal she was going to be the one. Perfect. Okay, final, final question. You're done with me. Any crazy street fight story or gym sparring story? Not street fight. I, I to be honest with you, I I never really even never even fought on the streets like that. But as far as gym stories, yeah, I've had I've had a few um <laughs> give a us few a good one. Give us a gym, good one. Huh? Give me a good one. Uh, shit, I've had a few. Well, to sum it up, I'm gonna make it quick, like. You know, there's always shit talking and shit like that. So this is one time um, a sparring partner was supposed to come down from a different state. It's pretty close to us. I'm in Connecticut. It's probably like Massachusetts or something that they were coming from. But they're late. Like, they're having us wait for a while. So I'm frustrated. I'm mad already. But we get in. We start sparring. It only lasted, I want to say, like two, three rounds. Not even three rounds. And we start, we start yapping and punching after the bell it turned into like a fucking wrestling match and a bunch of a bunch of crazy shit like a bunch of crazy shit within the gym and then um the guy ended up dislocating his shoulder because of the wrestling and stuff and um it led it kind of it kind of the altercation kind of went outside of the ring outside but my coach paul was like you know like talking to me like don't do it don't do that stupid like you need your hands you know like this and this and that like you know what i'm saying don't do nothing stupid that you're gonna regret so i was listening at the moment but i was furious like i, was, I had to like i had to walk out of the gym and take a walk that i was just so angry like i wanted to i wanted to take it to a different level but that's one little crazy story at the gym but there's been a lot of shit like that happens like people yap off and it turns into something that's not really supposed to be but like i'm not i don't know i've never been the type to disrespect or uh talk shit like I'll, I'll do it to someone i know um just just to fuck around but not like anybody that's not you know what i'm saying we don't have like type of relationship or anything but so it takes always little shit like that it what i hear from you is you're someone that you value respect and yeah. you don't you don't give that energy off you don't appreciate it being given to you and then you Correct. take it as like disrespect to your skill level like someone looking yeah at you, and that might be why you get the mad mike nickname because i think a lot of times 
people come in and they're insecure and they're nervous. And what do you do if you think you hurt, saw a ghost? You start yapping, right? You get scared, you run your mouth. And it sounds like that, uh, that automatically is going to create conflicts for you in the gym because yeah. they're going to mouth off because they're nervous and that's what pisses you off. And now you yeah. got, did you have a lot of like fight of the century kind of gym wars back in the day because of that? Yeah, I, that's that's exactly what I'm saying. That's really like, I, you you hit it on a nail for sure. Like I don't I don't talk shit or, you know, like if if you're coming in to work with me, like that's that's all it is. We're here to work. We're not here to fucking argue and talk shit and all that extra shit. Like I'm, you know, just trying to get my work in, do what I gotta do, and, and get out. Like I'm not here to fucking have an argument contest or whatever. Perfect. I guess one one thing came to me because I forgot where you're located. Tio Fimo's fighting Jermaine Ortiz, February 8th. Obviously, I'm pretty sure that you've gotten work with Jermaine Ortiz, being that he used to be located near you. What are your kind of thoughts on that, knowing that you know Jermaine, and maybe some insight to what Jermaine brings to the ring that people don't understand? Yeah, we've been, we actually was working with Jermaine, Jermaine this camp. Um, he was at my gym a couple weeks ago. Um, and he's still located around me. He's in out of Massachusetts. Uh, Worcester area. It's about like an hour from me. Um, but yeah, Jermaine, I think, I, man, I want Jermaine to do it, especially for New England. I think he he has the um, the ability to do it. Um, he has great movement, um, great, great uh, punch selection. He's real smart in there. Um, I'm just rooting for me and everybody around me are rooting for him. And we hope he pulls it off. I think he can, and I think he will. So you know, we'll, we'll be tuned in for sure for that one. Uh, for me, Jermaine, it's the size. I can't believe how big he is for his weight class. Yeah, he does have he that, me but, about how yeah. big he is for the division. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's going to play a factor. Well, I mean, it's, sure. when I look at him, it's like he he looks more like a junior middleweight, welterweight, and he was yeah. trying to shrink down to lightweight. I feel like that's what gave him such a – close fight with Loma was Loma just hated being in there with such a big man. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Definitely. I definitely agree. But yeah, Jermaine has some size on him, but I think he's going to do very well. I'm hoping he does well rooting for him. How do you stack up in terms of size with Jermaine? Are you about that size? Is he a little bigger? What do you, how would you assess it? No, nah, I think he's bigger than me to be honest. I mean, he's a big boy, bro. You know how big he is, <laughs> but I'm not, but, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not that big though. I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a huge guy. Like I'm not, you know what I mean? Okay. Because I, to me, Jermaine is like the hall of fame of barely making weight, weight cuts because he shows up with sunglasses on and a track suit fully zipped up and you can see that he's going through it. And by going through it, I mean a weight cut. Like he's one of yeah, those. I mean, I, yeah, I think, yeah, I think, uh, I just think he probably outgrew 35 a little bit. And I also but, um, think some guys are just big guys. Yeah, yeah, right. When they cut weight, it's just never going to be fun because they're, yeah. if, even if they're in shape, their body is built in a way to carry muscle. And like I've seen guys that have done everything right and then right. the cut still sucks. And I think he just, yeah, yeah. unfortunately, one of those guys that he probably eats right, does everything right. And every yeah. weight cut is going to be very hard. Yeah. Yeah. Could be. That's. So that's probably a question for for him personally. That's a charge it to the game. That's a charge it to yeah, the yeah. game thing. But um, okay. Well, I wish you the best. I'm gonna be tuned appreciate in, it. and I appreciate you taking time. Um, want to promote the fight? You know, it's a great fight. Pro Box putting on these amazing fights. It's January 13th. ProBoxTV.com. It's only a dollar ninety nine. That's less than a cup of coffee, and you get to yeah. see two of my favorite up and coming fighters. I'm a big fan of Luis Feliciano. I'm a big fan of you. I've been following you for a while. I'm not just saying it. I saw you fight on Showbox. Yeah. Talked to you in the past, and I want to congratulate both of you as long as, as well as ProBox for risking your zero. You know, we're yeah. in the post Mayweather era. Guys are getting in there, taking chances, trying to be great. And this is what brings interest back to boxing. So I really encourage people to go out, watch this fight to hardworking fighters, making an opportunity for themselves. Definitely. Appreciate you for having me. And for everyone out there, definitely tune in. Um, not only my fight, but the whole card is going to be a, a, a good night of fights. And um, the whole the whole Pro Box TV, like I said earlier, is doing great things, putting these um, events together and matching these, these, uh, these fights pretty evenly. And... Um, you know, setting guys up like like myself and, and Lewis and the rest of the people on the card.
you know, just to, just to be a company shield for ProBox, what I really like about it is they're investing in great fights, not fighters. So it's right. like if you if you win some good fights, OK, you're going to get an opportunity. But right. it's not like by any means we got to protect this guy. Correct. And that's what I think is hurting boxing is we we know there's four or five guys that we don't think are the best guys in the division. But the promoters think they can sell 10,000 tickets. So an IQ test, are you going to be a loyal fan of this fighter who you think is a cool person, but we don't know who we can fight or right. you can watch Frank Sanchez or Arnold Barbosa fight deep on the undercard who are probably worthy of a shot against that guy. Right. Uh, yeah, I agree. Definitely. I definitely agree for sure. Okay. You put up with me long enough. I wish you the best. <laughs> I will. Thank you, man. In Wednesday. All right. Appreciate